I don't forget. All right, so the recorder is on, and we are resuming our topic from last week. All right, so the question is, after one entire week, do you remember what we were talking about last Wednesday? Yes. Um, last Wednesday, we uh, programmed the three-bit wiser adder into the last Yes. All right. Excellent. So we did program, or I, you know, I basically made a three-bit carry ripple adder after the entire discussion of how the C function can be done using logical and and how the R function can be done using exclusive OR. And as a result, you know, and also on top of that, how the plus between the C when we calculate K of I plus one can be done using a logical OR instead of a arithmetic addition. So all of those combined allowed us to create a circuit to perform addition. It is called a ripple, carry ripple adder. So what is the disadvantage of the carry ripple adder? Go ahead. Yes, so the main problem with a carry ripple adder is the amount of time it takes to add is proportional to the number of bits in the number. If you have a 32-bit adder, it will take twice the time of a 16-bit adder. That the 16-bit adder will in return take twice the time of an 8-bit adder, and so on. Now, if this is the only way to do things, then it is the only way to do things, and we cannot complain about it. But it is not, okay? So that's why, you know, I also asked the class to read ahead of time, because, you know, the new topic, you know, the continuation of what, where we left the last time is going to be a little bit difficult um, because not only does it require that you uh, are familiar with everything that we talked about, it also requires that you understand the new notations and also the technique that we are going to use in order to make it faster. So I hope many of you have the time to kind of read ahead because you know, that is going to be an important thing in this class to do all the way to the end. Okay, This is going to be a pretty fast-paced class for the most part. Um, so keeping up with the pace of the class is really important because falling behind, I'm going to say, is not an option. Oh, any issues back there? You good? Okay. All right. All right. So I'm going to show you, you know, where things are, you know, and the user interface today to me is going to be a little bit clumsy because I do not have my extra VGA cable. So what you see on the whiteboard, I can only see through OBS, you know, the recording software. So it's going to be a little bit sluggish for me, but to you, it doesn't make any difference. So there we go. And we are, you know, on adding binary numbers. So the first thing I'm going to do is to kind of go through a few examples, or at least one example of how we perform multi-bit binary addition using the same format that I introduced, you know, adding but I was using base 10 here before. So I'm going to switch to the tablet, and I will go ahead and add you know, two numbers in base 2. So the first number is, I'm just going to make this up, 1, 0, 1, 0, okay? And I want to add to it, put a 1 here, put a 1 over here, maybe put another 1 over here, and, ah, what the heck, yeah, put another 1 over here. So... The format that I use has five rows. Can somebody recall the name of the five rows? Q, K, and S. Okay, very good. So that is good you know, because you know, knowing the nomenclature of the rows is important so that this way when I refer to a particular digit, you guys know where to find it. All right, so in this case, because we are not... Uh, this is not a continuation of another addition, so the K0 is assumed to be 0 in this case, but in general, K0 cannot be assumed to be 0. It is one of the inputs to the adder. All right, and we are going to do this using the binary addition method, which means the Q of I is how, how do we calculate the Q of I when we already know that everything is in base 2. 
I mentioned that a little bit earlier in the class, but we also talked about it exclusively last week. So how do we calculate Q of I? The R function. Hmm? The R function. And how does the R function look like for binary numbers? Uh, it's mod two. Okay, that, mod is an arithmetic operation. How do I do the same thing without doing arithmetics? We spent some time to talk about that last week. So R of x, y is yes. Exclusive or, very good. Okay, so we can use exclusive or instead of you know adding and then modding to, fig to figure out the answer of the R function. Okay, so now we can look at the zero and the one. So it's harder for me to do it now because I have to coordinate between my left hand controlling the PC and then the right hand you're writing on the tablet. So the, the zero exclusive or with one is a one. One exclusive or with one is a zero, that's a one, that's a zero. So I can figure out the entire row of Q because we know Q of I is X of I exclusive or with Y of I. Because only for base two, we can use exclusive or instead of the addition followed by a mod operation. All right, so if, that, if you vaguely remember that discussion, it's okay. If you say, yeah, I know that, you know, I, I just you know, help you remember that, great. On the other hand, if somebody is saying, I have no idea what this is or where it's coming from, I would start to worry, okay? Because you know, I really need to make sure this entire class is up to speed with the current pace you know, where we are you know, in, the, in the content. Starting to worry is okay, you know, because you know, that means you know, people just have to put in a little bit extra time to review the material and also to understand the material. So we are not quite to the point where I would say I would start to panic. Now that would not be good, okay? Let's hope we will never get to that point. <clears throat> All right, so what about the K? So K of I plus one is, okay, how is it defined? We have talked about this quite a bit already, so can someone quote the original definition of K of I plus one? That should be hammered in your mind now. Yes, go ahead. Isn't it C of X I and Y I plus C of Q I and K I? Yes, that is correct. All right, but for base two, we make it easier, right? So for base two, how do we implement the C function? The usual way for the C function involves adding and then the comparison thing, but for base two, we make it very simple. We replace it with a single Boolean operator, and what is that? Go ahead. Negated and? Not negated, just regular and. Okay, just regular and. So this one becomes X of I. I will do the long hand for now. And then this is Q of I and K of I. And then we also figure out that the only difference between a logical or versus a, an arithmetic addition is when both sides of the operators are ones. And last Wednesday, what did we figure out? We compared the two tables, right? We have one table working on logical or we have another table working on arithmetic addition, and they only differ by one row. And which row is that? When both sides of the operators are ones, right. Okay, but can that happen given the context of the left hand side is xi and yi, the right hand side is qi and ki, and qi is defined to be the exclusive or between xi and yi. Do you remember that we have another truth table that has eight entries, and what was the purpose of that particular truth table? Go ahead. Wasn't it to prove that it can't um, be used with 
right? We cannot have both of the C functions to return ones. In other words, <clears throat> the left hand side of this plus and the right hand side of this plus, they cannot be both ones. That was what we did on last Wednesday. All right? And if you say, yep, I, I, I got that, I just cannot remember the details, it's okay. Okay, you know, we, you know, sometimes we cannot remember all the details, but if that is completely new to, you know, anyone in this class, I would start to worry, okay? So that means, you know, we cannot replace this whole thing with, now this is the shorthand, what looks like a multiplication is actually conjunction, but I will emphasize that we can now use logical or, okay, so I'm gonna use the same consistent Shorthand here, but looks like multiplication is actually conjunction. All right, so that is how k of i plus 1 can be redefined when we are only working with base 2. Are we doing okay so far? So based on the responses earlier, let me, do, let me ask you one more thing. For each unit of lecture, for each hour of lecture that you spend here, how many hours are you supposed to spend outside of the lecture and the lab for reviewing, for reading, and stuff like that? Two hours. Two hours, that's right. Okay, so make sure you budget enough time for this class because I find that some most of the time it is not a matter of do we know what to do, it is a matter of do we have time to do it. So budgeting is a, is a key factor to be successful in the class. All right, so that is basically how we left off. You know, we have these equations, and then S of i is just exclusive or as well. That's the exclusive or between which two. Yep. Uh, our function of k and i, I mean, q and i and k and i. Yep, q of i. And then k of i. All right. So what we have on the on the board right now that defines binary addition entirely. Okay. You know, we can figure out every single digit, given x, y, and k zero. We can figure out the rest using only the equations on the whiteboard. <clears throat> so the idea is, we did not just come up with this stuff, you know, last Wednesday. These were all derived by an example in base 10 edition. All I did was to look at base 10 edition and I re-examined how we do base 10 multi-digit addition. We came up with the R function, which is also called the single digit sum between two digits. We came up with the carry function, which basically says, okay, if I add up these two digits, is the resulting value, can it be represented by a single digit? If not, then the carry is a one. If so, the carry is a zero. So that's how we started this entire discussion was with base 10 addition. All I did, okay, in, a, in addition to the base 10 addition example was to give these things names, okay? So, um, so we have column zero, column one, column two, column three, and this is column four, which correspond to the bit positions. So now that we have the equations, let's figure out the entire you know, whole calculation here. What should I put? Um, okay, I have to <clears throat> move my mouse pointer here. So what should we put here? And why do we put that here? So the first thing you need to do is to say this bit here is, if you look at the k of i plus 1, i is 0 for this particular bit. So we have to look at a conjunction between x i y i or x 0 y 0 in this case. What would that be? What is the conjunction between y, z, x0, y0? Don't look at me. Look at the numbers. <laughs> hmm? It would be a false or a zero. Okay, very good. And But we're not done yet because we also have a second component here. We also have to look at the conjunction between q0, k0, and what would be the conjunction between q0 and k0? Also a false, okay? So we end up with false or false, which is false. So that's why this is a false here. And now we move on to this position. So for this position, i is 1, because we need to figure out what is k of 2. So i is 1 in this particular equation here. 
So we need to look at X1, Y1, and we also need to look at Q1, K1. So can someone tell me what is the conjunction of X1, Y1? It is true, and I can already make a conclusion because if one side of an OR is a one already, then the OR is going to be a one. And now we move on to the next digit, which is K of three, which means I is two when we look at this equation. So can someone tell me what is X2, Y2? X2 and Y2 is? It's false because we are looking at this zero and this one, so that means it is false. <clears throat> On the other hand, what is Q2 and K2? There'll be a, yeah. There'll be a one because your know, K2 is a one, Q2 is a one as well, so we have a one. So we have false or true, which is a true if we put it here. And then the last position is over here. This is K4 in this case. And I'm just going to say it's going to be a 1 because we have a 1 here and we also have a 1 here. So X3 and Y3 is a 1 already. So K4 is going to be a 1. <clears throat> and now we work on the sum row, which is using this particular um, expression here. So we are just looking at the exclusive OR. So I just quickly fill this up. This is a 1. That's a 0. That's a 0. That's a 1. And that's it. So do we have any questions about what I just did here? No questions. All right. All right, so how do we double check? How do we double check that this answer is indeed correct? So one way to do it is to look at x. x is a number in base 2, but what value is being represented by x? So we're going back to base conversion, okay? So how many people still remember base conversion or how to read a number to figure out the value? You um, start typing zero digits and mm -hmm. each digit upwards is a base on two. So zero would be zero. Mm -hmm. um, and one would be four, I believe. It's a two because it's two to the power of one. Yeah, two to the power of one. Two to the zero. Mm-hmm. And then three would be uh three would be zero. Mm-hmm. So that multiplier is zero. But four would be sixteen. Two to the power of three is an eight. Oh, sorry, I'm 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 looking at the four. Right. Okay. So you can also look at this using this way. You know, this is the number of ones, this is the number of twos the number of fours, and this is the number of eights. And then this one is actually the number of sixteens. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So that means x is actually representing a value of 10. Very good. What we know as 10. Okay, so x is 10. And what about y? y has all ones, so we have 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8, and that would be... 15, very good. <clears throat> so these are all in base 10, and the end result is a 25. Then you look at sum, okay? What is sum representing? It's 1 plus nothing plus nothing plus 8. That would be a 9, right? So the sum itself is representing 9. You go like, that's not right. You know, 9 is not 25. Wait, hold on a second here. We got this extra carry bit here. That carry bit is basically saying, with only four digits, we cannot store, we cannot represent the value of the sum. And that's why you know, there's a carry to K4. But the carry of K4 specifically is basically saying, we got 16 left over that cannot be represented in these four digits. So if you include that extra 16, because of the extra one over here as K4, then yes, we actually have 9 plus 16 because of the carry, and that's 25 too. So this gives me a pretty good feeling that I did not mess up the binary addition at all. All right. Do we have any questions? All righty. <clears throat> 
No questions? Yep. Um, can you do an exclusive board to Tinder real quick? Yes. Well, okay. Is yes? This, what, what is the rule of it again? Okay, but exclusive or is a shorthand. What was the other way to write the R function? I will look it up for you because I want to show you that it is actually in the notes and hopefully it will help to emphasize the importance of reading the notes, right? So I'm just going to look for exclusive. Oh, okay, exclusive. There's none of those. Okay. Maybe XOR. Nope. All right. So I have to actually look for the definition. All right. So we are moving down to this part here. This is the original definition in base two using the R function. So where the cursor is right here. What does that mean? Can someone tell me what the right hand side of the equality is trying to say? What is the exclamation point representing? Negation, or logical negation to be exact. And then it looks like a multiplication. You know, can we multiply Boolean values? That doesn't make sense to me. So what looks like multiplication is actually, it's an and, it's a conjunction. And then the plus here is actually an or. Okay, very good. All right, so that means that we can now, you know, uh, rewrite exclusive or using this expression. So I will switch back to the tablet and basically say we have x, we have y, and then we have x and not y or not x and y. And x can be false, true, y can be false, true, false, true. So that's basically exclusive or spelled out using only operators that we are familiar with. So once again, you know, just coming to the lecture is a part of taking this class. Reading these module is actually a good portion of this class as well. So we have, you really have to still find the time to go back and read the module, okay? Because I cannot cover 100% of what is written in the module. The class itself is basically a presentation, interactive presentation of the material that is also in the notes. All right, so I will just claim, okay, I'm, without any proof, I'm just going to claim that this is the truth table that you should end up with, which also is, you know, just, with, just x exclusive of with y would end up with exactly the same, you know, values over here. That's a good question, okay, yeah, but it is in the notes, okay, so it's really important to read the notes. Are we still doing okay? All right. And of course, you know, there might be a question of, you know, what happened to those people who refuse or, you know, do, cannot find the time to read the notes? Typically, I see them in the following semester. I mean, really, I'm not kidding you, nor, I'm, nor am I trying to scare people. It is just, you know, usually naturally what happens. All right. So are we ready to move on? Because I spent about half an hour reviewing material that we have already covered. So if this, if, if this feels familiar, we're good. If this feels like super familiar, like, oh, I, I remember every single one of this thing, these things here, it's in my notes, okay? I actually wrote my own notes. It, it, the definitions are all there. Good for you, okay? So you kind of have to do that kind of self-assessment along the way, because if you're starting to feel that you're falling behind, for whatever reason, okay, you know, it is not necessarily something that you have control over, but you might be able to do something to catch up. So I'm usually available before this class, and right after this class is my office hour, so if you need 
to talk to me about you know, anything related to this class, just come talk to me. All right? All right. Okay. So now we can actually move on to talk about carry look ahead. So that's all in section six. <clears throat> so section six starts with this little, thick, thick, well, I shouldn't say little, but this derivation in Boolean algebra. So instead of spending time to explain the derivation itself, I'll skip the explanation of the derivation. It is all based on Boolean algebra. If you have taken CISP 440 or discrete structure, the derivation should look familiar. Okay, You should understand Boolean algebra enough to read through the proof itself. On the other hand, if you have not taken CISP 440, this is kind of like an exposure to what Boolean algebra is about. It is kind of like algebra, except the rules are a little bit different. There are things here that you would go like, I'm not sure we can do this in normal arithmetic, but in Boolean algebra, we can do all that. But the bottom line <clears throat> is we start off with k of i plus 1 depending on k of i. This is the reason why the carry ripple adder has a linear dependency. Because until we figure out what is k of 3, we cannot figure out what is k of 4. Until we figure out what is k of 4, we cannot figure out what is k of 5, and so on. So the linear dependency has to do with the definition of k of i plus 1 refers to k of i. That is the problem. Okay, And then somebody is going to point out and say, but after all of these, these derivation, we did not solve the problem because, x, uh, because k of i plus 1 still depends on k of i. All I have done is to move the symbols around a little bit, change the operators a little bit. So instead of xi and yi or qi k and ki, I now have xi and yi or in parentheses xi or yi and then the whole thing and k of i. Go like, okay, so what is that going to buy us? You know, why do we want to do this? <clears throat> Just like I did with my Tuesday, Thursday class, I'm going to tell people, write this down, okay, in your own notes, okay? Because this little paragraph that doesn't look very important is actually very important. Because we are now defining two additional terms. One is g of i, which is the conjunction of x i, y i. And then the other one is p of i, which is the disjunction of x i, y i. So make sure you write it down now, okay? Be, or take notes for in whatever way you want to, okay? Because these two definitions, you know, how we define the g of i and the p of i is really important. So you go like, okay, so that doesn't seem important at all. Because you know, all we're going to say is, okay, we have a shorthand of g of i being the conjunction of x i y i, and then p of i being the disjunction of x i y i. So the, the first thing we notice is instead of writing this expression referring to the conjunction of x i y i and also the disjunction of x i y i, we can now instead use g of i and p of i instead. So it looks simpler. So I'm, let me move my mouse pointer to this you know, new definition of k of i plus 1. Do we have any questions about how I just used the definition of g of i, p of i, and make the expression looking just a little bit simpler? Okay? Are there any questions? Okay, no questions? All right. So when we look at this and go like, okay, but we still have not solved the problem. Because k of i plus 1 still depends on k of i, even though the expression now looks a little bit simpler. Are we good so far? All right, so the magical moment is going to happen in, I would say, about two minutes. So the first thing we want to do is to say, OK, can we use this to figure out what is k of 1? So like, OK, if we want to figure out what is k of 1, i needs to be? Zero. So k of 1 is g of 0 or p of 0 and k of 0. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit so that you can see that you know, how we utilize the general equation to figure out what is k of 1. It is difficult to avoid references to k of 0 because k of 0 is an input to the entire mechanism. 
So you cannot say, oh, let's try to avoid references to one of the inputs. That would be pretty much impossible. So this one, we go like, yeah, it's okay. We can, we can live with this. But then what about k of two, okay? So if I want to use this particular definition to figure out what is k of two, what would I be in the case of k of two? I needs to be one, right? So we have k of two being g of one or g of one and k of one. Is that okay? It's a direct application of where the mouse point is pointing to. Is that okay? All right. So this is the magical moment. I think we are about two minutes from where, when I said there will be a magical moment in about two minutes. Because we already know what k of one is. What is k of one? We just figured it out like that. So instead of referring to k of one, I'm just gonna change k of one to the expression that computes k of one. So from here to here, okay, let me use the mouse pointer so it's also going to be recorded. So from here to here, do we have any questions? Yes? Uh, I think I'm thinking too ahead, but how would we apply something like this? We will get to that, okay? You know, how, we, how the circuit is going to look like, okay? So we'll get to that part, okay? So once we have the second row, from the second row to the third row, it looks like distribution in normal algebra, and it is distribution in Boolean algebra. Okay, so distribution works the same way when we are dealing with Boolean algebra. So now we end up with something like this. We go like, okay, that seems pretty magical because we don't have any references to k of one anymore. K of zero, k of two now is completely defined using the p and the g terms, and only k of zero. There are no references to k of one anymore. We have broken the linear dependency. Yep? Okay, so what about if we're figuring out k of three, would it also just increment to k of nine? Ooh, ooh, I'm glad you asked that question because there we go. <laughs> Excellent question. So we have k of three. In order to figure out k of three, we apply that general equation. So k of three is g of two or p of two and k of two, okay? Then you go like, wait, but tag, we just figure out what is k of two. So k of two is this term over here, this entire expression. So now that we look at this k of two, it's like, oh, we can just go ahead and use this particular expression to replace the entire k of two. The same trick, right? The trick is, we just expand the k of i using a, an expression that only refers to k of zero and all the p and the g terms. Is that okay? And this is the magic. I mean, this is really the magic of carry look ahead, you know, adder, is we just do substitution. After the substitution, we do a distribution, and now we end up with, well, it is a longer and messier expression, but once again, k of 3 has no references to k of 1 or k of 2 anymore. It only has a reference of k of 0. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. But, okay, you know, I think that's one of your, one of your original questions is, um, but the, the expression is getting longer isn't that going to take longer to evaluate? We, we might as well just you know, do it you know, sequentially. Well, it depends on who is doing it. Because if you and I are doing this, then yes, we have to figure out, okay, what is P of zero? What is G of zero? What is P of one? What is G of one? And we have to do all that sequentially. Once we have the P and the G terms, then we look at this messy here, the messy, this messy expression here, and then we go like, okay, now we have to figure out the conjunction of this one. Then we figure out the conjunction of this one. Then we figure out the conjunction of this one. Then we perform the overall disjunction of, of the entire thing. I don't think we're saving any time tack. Well, that's because we are not, we, our brain is not logic gate based. Okay, so now you have to think 
in the terms of logic gates. Okay. So to explain that, I think it's best to use a graphical way to display it. So the first thing, which is related to the lab today, is how do I figure out p of zero? Okay. So given that I have x zero, y zero, and I want to figure out what is p of zero and what is g of zero, how do we do it in in the circuit sense? Well, the logical AND is done by an AND gate. The logical OR is done by an OR gate, right? So uh, this is not too hard. I need an OR gate here to compute the P of 0. I need an AND gate here to compute the G of 0. Uh, X0 needs to go to one of the inputs of both of these gates, and the Y of 0 would be the other input of the same gates. I'll be good with the, I'll be okay with this circuit. That will figure out what is P of zero, it will figure out what is G of zero. And what about uh, P of one and G of one? Ah, kind of the same thing. Okay, so X of one, Y of one, P of one, G of one, uh, a OR gate here to figure out what is P of one an AND gate here to figure out what is G of 1. And then we have the same kind of topology or the same kind of connectivity between the gates. Okay, this one goes down here, goes to here. This one goes up here, hook up here. Okay. So if I say, okay, let's go ahead and make a 16-bit adder. What are you going to think? And then we have to replicate this design, right? Okay, so that's one. Okay, it is. Oh man, that's that's a lot of tedious work, and I hate tedious work. I don't want to do tedious work. So the first thing is, oh, we can use a multi-bit adder in this case. So instead of having these, you know, individual single-bit adder, single-bit AND gates and single-bit OR gates sprinkled all over the place, we just go like, hmm. Instead of doing this. I have a multi-bit you know, input pin for X and for Y. Then I have a multi-bit OR gate and a multi-bit AND gate and a multi-bit P and a multi-bit uh, G, like so. The connectivity is still exactly the same, but you can see how, oh, this looks a lot cleaner. It's look, it looks a whole lot easier to do just in terms of you know, what you need to do in autism. This is why we need to use multi-bit gates, okay? Because what happens with, when you use a multi-bit gate is, this is bit zero, this is bit one, bit zero, bit one, bit zero, bit one, bit zero, bit one. This will actually just do whatever P of I is X of I, and uh, or, okay, this is a, or y of i, g of i is xi and yi. In other words, we take the bits, okay, in a multi-bit pin, input pin or output pin. Well, let's look at the input pins. So bit zero is ended with bit zero to make bit zero on the output. Bit one is ended with bit one to make out the output on of bit one and so on. So that means if I want to make this design 16 bit wide, what do I need to do? I just go to, I select everything here. I go to the lower left portion of the screen and I say bit width is moved to 16. I'm all done. Instead of you know, recreating all of these tiny little gates. But it's important to look at the tiny little gates here, you know, the individual gates. Because, let me ask you this question. If I build this as a circuit, do I have to wait until P0 and G0 are done before I get started with P1 and G1? Are there any dependency between P0 and P... And, uh, excuse me. Does P1 depend on P0 or G0? Do you see any wire connecting those things? I don't. Do you think G1 depends on P0 or G1? 
No. So that means all four gates, okay, all four of these gates, they can all carry computation all at the same time. Does that make sense? Now, this is important because you cannot do that. <laughs> when I ask you to compute your, all of these individual bits, if I ask you about what is B0, what is G0, what is P1, what is G1, you have to do it sequentially because that's what your conscious mind can do is to do one thing at a time. But when this is done using circuits in the computer, they can all happen at the same time. Is that okay? So the amount of time that it takes when between you know, all the x, y are available to when p, the, the p and the g terms are available, this amount of time is called a propagation de delay. Propagation delay. And from here on, I'll just abbreviate it to one pd. It depends on the circuit, okay? We already know that you know, the OR and the AND gates can all be implemented using transistors. The transistors um, has, a, has a certain delay, okay? You know, it's because of the capacitance of the gate, but you know, from our perspective, all we have to say is, yeah, it takes a little bit of time. Are we good with that concept? From the moment the inputs are available to the time the output is correct based on the input, it takes a little bit of time, typically measured in you know, uh, either whole nanoseconds or a fraction of a nanosecond. Are we good so far with that concept? Yes? Uh, I think I missed why it causes the delay. Okay, so I can explain you know, just kind of superficially you know, why there's a delay. Do you remember this symbol? I certainly hope so, because we spent basically the first class just talking about this symbol. What is it? Transistor. It's a transistor, and what type is it? It's an N-type. The P-type has a bubble. The N-type does not have a bubble. It's okay. I mean, it's, that part is actually not important. This part here, okay, it looks like the capacitor. Okay, for those of you who have taken you know, electrical uh, physics, you know, using electricity, you know, electrical physics, I'm not even sure how to call that. But there's a physics class that talks about capacitance, resistance, and that sort of stuff, circuits. So this is a capacitor. It takes time to charge up and change the state. Okay? And that's why there's a delay. Because from the time the gate has a voltage change, to the time that the other side is experiencing the field effect, there's a slight delay because of the because of the capacitance, and also the conductor leading to here also has resistance as well as inductance. All of those things combined is basically making the signal you know arrive slower than we would like it to be. So that's the reason why there's a delay because it has to do with the physical aspect of a transistor. Is that okay so far? Okay. So this part is not super important. I wouldn't put too much attention to it. But you know, since it was asked, you know, I kind of felt it. Yeah, maybe I should explain that. Okay. So okay. So this is this is good. But what about those equations? So let's go back to the equations and see what kind of circuit it's going to look like. So we are going to take a look at K1 first. Okay. K1 has an overall OR gate because the last operation is an OR, and the, the one of the input of the OR gate is the output of this AND gate here. All right, so I'm going to draw that out. So K1 is going to be the result of an OR, where one input goes to you know K0, I believe. No, it's G1, G0, and then the other one goes to an AND gate. And the AND gate connects to K0 and P0. Okay? So that's how we do K1. Is that okay? Based on the equation? Are we making a correspondence or we, it can we correlate between this formula here, this equation here, and this picture over here? Yeah, I know I, I'm not the best person to draw a picture, but I think the... I, the idea comes across. Yep. So 
So if we so yeah, that is the correct way, but so if we leave k of two, mm -hmm. would we just since it corresponds to the last element and so we don't have to rely on k um, k of i, we just uh, we rely on k of zero and use that. Do we just in order to uh, do k of two? We just refer back to the previous um, circuit. Nope. Because the, it's the, whole, the whole idea is we don't want it to be sequential. So we look at the definition of k of 2. We use the third one. We use this last equation here. So what is this going to look like in a circuit in, you know, as, a, as logic gates? The overall is still an OR gate. And then we have one AND gate that has two inputs. And then we have one AND gate that has three inputs. Does that make sense? So we have one circuit, we, we have one AND gate that is ending P1, P0, K0. We have another AND gate ending P1, G0. This one is on its own, it doesn't need a gate. And then once we have all three terms available, then they all go into a final OR gate to give us the output of K2. Is that okay? So what we'll do is we're going to kind of draw the topology or the general shape of that circuit. So this is what K2 is going to look like. The last operation is an OR, but this time the OR has three inputs. One input goes to G1, <clears throat> one input goes to an AND gate that itself has two inputs, and then the other uh, input of the OR gate goes to the output of another AND gate, but this one has three inputs. Is that okay? Are there any questions about how we are mapping the equations to the corresponding circuit? Are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> so the OR gate cannot really give you any usable result until the AND gates are done. Does that make sense? But between these two AND gates, they can occur at the same time. There's no dependency between the AND gates. So when you look at K3, okay, it's actually just about the same, except it looks even uglier, because we have an OR gate that has four inputs this time. One is just going to um, G, I think G2 in this case. And then the other one, this one goes to an AND gate that has two inputs. This one goes to an AND gate that has three inputs. And this one goes to another AND gate that has four inputs this time. But do you see how the AND gates, they can all compute at the same time? So that means regardless, okay, it would appear to me that it would take the same amount of time to get K1, and it takes the same amount of time to get K2, and it takes the same amount of time to get K3 because they have the same number of stages of gates to go through. Okay, so assuming you have all the P and the G terms already available, this is the first stage. Okay, the first stage consists of all the AND gates involved in the circuits. That's stage one. Okay, if this is stage zero, we'll call this you know, stage zero. Then this, you know, what I have highlighted here, this is stage one, and then stage two will be the OR gates. So regardless of which K bit you want to figure out, it will take three propagation of delays, guaranteed. Okay, so what about K4? What is K4? What does K4 look like as a circuit? I mean, from this, let's see whether we can generalize or not. Yep. So you would start with a four gate mm -hmm. that has five. Um, exactly. Five inputs. Yeah, five inputs. Mm -hmm. And then um, you start with three AND gates. No, four. Yep. Four AND gates. Yep. One that goes to G three. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. One that goes to G three, and one that goes to 
One has two inputs. One of the AND gates has two inputs. One has three, one has four, and then the last one has five inputs. That's the pattern, okay? That's very good. So what you have just done is by observing the few examples I have presented, your mind is generalizing. You are recognizing the pattern of how we go from one step to another step. So you're not generalizing and go like, oh, okay, I know what the next circuit is going to look like. Okay? That is, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 that's, that's okay. So, so each KFI or KF1, 2, 3, responds to the bit, right? Yes, so each K of something is one of the K bits. It is a single binary digit. Yes. So if you were doing, let's say, how you said earlier, a 16 digit bit addition, yeah. would we have to increment KFI, KF2, KF3, maybe? Yes. So it's, it's going to be a complex circuit because we cannot reuse, okay? We cannot reuse part of K1 in K2. We cannot reuse part of K2 in K3, nor do we use K1 as a part of K2 because that would basically lead us to back to the same linear dependency that we were talking about before. But this means, you know, regardless of which K we are computing, it is always just three propagational delay from having the X, Y, and the K0 being available. Is that okay? Are we good so far? Okay. So now, you know, we go back to, okay, but what, are the, what about these dangling you know, connections? Where do they connect to? What is the pattern over there? So to figure that out, okay, you can go back to the slide here, and you scroll all the way to the bottom, and here's a really kind of crazy notation that you go like, I have no idea what that means. That's okay, the first time you look at this and you have no idea what it means. And this is my attempt down here to illustrate what the big AND, you know, which is the TP notation, and what the big OR notation is trying to express. So, um, so I will proceed to explain this in just a little bit. But before that, do we have any questions? No? Okay, well, let's take a short break. I, I, we are going to take a uh, take roll right now. So let me make this available to you guys first, and then we'll show the answer to the roll taking activity. Uh, the passcode or the access code is keep up in all lowercase. I use every single opportunity to nag. Yes. It's an occupational hazard of being a dad. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, I forgot that I already set the time. Okay, give me a second here to reset the time. All right, try that now. Do a refresh and it should let you in that. So once again, the access code is keep up. Does anyone need more time for role taking? We all good? All right. So we're going to get back to the hairy notation here. All right. So to explain this you know, kind of hairy notation, it is related to sigma, the summation notation. So what I'll do is I am going to give us you know, some simple cases first, okay, just so that we know what it is. So if you have an OR, this is a big OR notation, and index you know, has a starting point that is greater than the um, ending point. So let's say this is P of I. This is by default the identity of OR, which is false. That's by definition. So if you start with a start index number three that is greater than the end index value, which is two in this case, then the, you have a default answer of 
false. Okay. And then for the opposite, this is conjunction, um, the same setup. Okay. This is going to be true because true is the identity of conjunction. So this gives us the end case. So now we can look at the usual, you know, cases like what if I start with two and we end at three and we're looking at p of i, then it's just your p of two or p of three in this case. Is that okay? The start and the end number can be the same. So if I go from three to three of g of i, then this is just g of three itself. So are we starting to understand the concept of the big N and the big OR notation? They're basically just like the sigma notation, except instead of adding everything, we are either ending everything or we are ORing everything. Is that part okay? All right. Okay. Then we're going to take a look at the equation again, and then this time, we are going to work out you know, what is um, k of 3, okay? Because we know what k of 3 is supposed to be. So if I need to use this equation here to figure out what is k of 3, what does n need to be? 2. Two. Very good. So n needs to be 2. So let me, let me try to do this, okay? I'm going to resize this window so that way I can show both the... Um, the tablet and the generalized equation at the same time. So just give me a second here to, oh, okay, I minimized it, didn't I? Yeah, all right, so I don't want to minimize. I want to resize it, so I need to uh, maximize first and then resize it. But I can't see the screen. Oh, okay, there we go, that works. Okay, excellent. All right, so now I can work this out. And let me switch back to OBS on this side. All right, so n is 2. So k of 3 is, now this time I'm expanding. So the big OR notation is going to expand 1 when i equals to 0. So when i equals to 0, we have g of 0, and, and then in here we have the big N notation of j starting, oops, okay, back to back. There we go. So j is going to go from where to where? j is supposed to start with i plus 1, and in this case i is 0, so j will start with 1. Very good. So it starts with starting with 1 to n. n is already known as 2. And then the, in the equation, we have p of j inside here. And then we have this or. So that or, this or here, is corresponding to this or over here. And then we have, um, oh, wait, OK, I take it back. We have i being 1, because we have three iterations. When i equals to 1, then we have g of 1 and J is starting from when i is 1, J, A, J starts with 2, n is 2 anyway, and then p of j like that, or i equals to 2. Because remember, i as an index starts with 0, it ends with 2, so there are three iterations there. So when i equals to 2, then we have g of 2, and, and then in the big N notation, this time j starts with 3, ends with 2, p of j, like so. So what I have written so far, this entire thing, is corresponding to expanding only this portion, expanding the big OR notation. Do we have any questions about what I am trying to, uh, trying to illustrate here? You look at this notation as a loop. This is the start value, this is the end value, and then for each value, including both ends, we go through one iteration. So that's why we have three iterations, because when n equals to 2, then we have 0 to 2, we have 0, 1, 2. There are three iterations. When i equals to 0, this is the term that 
the, this portion is producing, when i equals 1, this is the term that this portion is producing, and when i equals to 2, this is the term that this portion is, it is producing. So are we doing okay so far with just expanding the, that one side? Okay. So now we are working on the other side. So that we have this OR here. So we basically say there's an OR, and then we have a K0. And so in this case, I'm going to expand it. Um, can someone tell me what this is going to expand into? Just, you know, one, just do a one-shot expansion. How many iterations do we go through? Three iterations, because n is 2 in this case. So we have n i equals to 0, i equals 1, and i equals 2. And then for each one of those instances, we just want to refer to p of i. So which three of i's are we ending together in this case? Exactly. Very good. So we have, I'm running out of space here, so I'm going to kind of put it up here. So we have P0 and P1 and P2 over here. All right. So now I'm almost done. So now I look at this term here, and what does that expand to? We have J going from 1 to 2. How many iterations do we have? Two iterations. And what is the conjunction? What is the resulting conjunction from going through those two iterations? P1 and P2. What about this one? How many iterations are we going through? The start index. Exactly. There's only one iteration. And what term is it producing? Just P2. Just P2. Yep. What about this one? This one is tricky because you know, we are starting with a number that is larger than the end number. But according to what we defined earlier, this would give us no. It's true because it is a conjunction. Okay. Yep. That's okay. Okay. So now, you know, what do we end up with? We end up with okay. Let me use my mouse pointer this time. So we end up with the conjunction between G zero P one P two or the conjunction between G1 and P2, and the conjunction between G2 and true itself, which basically means you know, it's just G2 by itself, and also the conjunction between K0, P0, P1, P2. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Okay. Well, it's not from the last lecture. It is actually from today's lecture. Because we, when we expanded using the technique that we were using before, um, we ended up having K3 defined as the logical OR between G2, P2, and G1, P2, and P1, and G0, P2, and P1, and P0, and K0. This is exactly the same. It's just that the, or the ordering of things is off a little bit. But that's a perfectly okay, because between disjunction and conjunction, both operators are commutative. What does that mean, commutative? What does that mean, that an operator is commutative? That's right. The ordering does not matter. X or Y is the same thing as Y or X. X and Y is also the same thing as X, uh, Y and X. Okay. In Boolean algebra, I claim that that is an axiom. But are you guys just going to buy it? Buy this car. It has a gas mileage of 75 miles per, per, per gallon. You're going to say, okay, prove it, right? You know, let me drive it for a while and then I will see for myself here whether that's the, that's the actual gas mileage. Okay? A car salesman can fool you and get your money, and you won't realize that you, know, you, just, you just got a lemon. 
But if I say something that's not true about Boolean you know, algebra, you can tell right away. And what is the technique to prove to yourself that conjunction is commutative? The truth table, very good. Okay, so how do we do that? Okay, so you have two independent variables. These are the four ways to combine the possible, these are all the combinations that you can combine the values of x and y. We have x or y here, we have y or x here. So this is false, false. This is true, 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 true. Okay, this is the same as that. It is as simple as that, okay? Now, this is, I'm mentioning all of these opportunities because these are things that you can do to practice. What do you practice when you are saying, okay, Tech said that you know, the disjunction in this case is commutative, and I just showed myself using a truth table that they are indeed commutative. But what are you practicing here? Did you just waste like two minutes of your entire life for nothing? Or is this you know, actually leading something, leading to somewhere that can be related to your future endeavor? You know, whether it's you know, the four-year university or at work, you know, how does this relate? Yep, it is one, the tendency to validate the tendency to question whether something is true or not, and also having the means to do it. Okay, the, the, the technique of using a truth table is extremely helpful, especially in computer science. Okay, so all of those you know, may seem like a waste of time in this class, but it will all come back later. Okay, you know, it will all be kind of useful at a later time. All right, so getting back to this picture here, let me go back to, I'm going to re-expand it, maximize. So, so this overall representation is a way to generate the expression using carry look ahead as a technique to figure out a particular K term. Okay, so if I were to ask you to do it by hand, what is K of 64? You go like, I don't think I, I, I have, I need extra pens to do this. And my, my pen is gonna run out of ink today. And I might two, need two days to write all that stuff out because K of 64 is gonna have 65 terms to or, and then the 60, 64 of those terms would be and or conjunctions, starting with two input, three inputs, four inputs, all the way down to 65 inputs. So that's going to be a horrendous equation for you to write, okay? But you are here because you want to become a programmer, a coder, a developer, a software engineer, and so on. So are you going to do it by hand if your boss said, give me the expression of K65 or K64? You're going to do it by hand? The, the simple answer of yes will qual disqualify you from the job. Okay, so you're gonna say, no, I am not gonna do this by hand. What are you gonna do? Since we have a pattern already, go ahead. Have the computer do it. Okay, but how do you get the computer to do it? I know, we can ask OpenAI. OpenAI, you know, just you use a prompt and say, give me the expression of K64 using carry look ahead technique. That's not gonna work. Okay, because OpenAI, is only as knowledgeable as the text that it has been fed with, okay? So if it has not been exposed to the carry look ahead mechanism, it wouldn't know the answer. There's a very simple answer to this entire thing. And all I need to do is to scroll down because the big and and the big or code here, that is actual C code. In other words, <coughs> you, you do have to modify this a little bit because this will do the actual computation. But if you wanted to crank out like the, the equations and whatnot, all you have to do is to say, oh, instead of doing the actual computation, 
append to the string and make the string longer you know, as you create the expressions. That's all you need to do. Now, if you were to do the same thing, but in JavaScript, it'll be much easier, okay? Because JavaScript has superior ways of combining things into strings or break up a string into individual things. But you can do it by code. Once you understand the mechanism, it's the same mechanism to figure out what is k of 1, k of 2, all the way to k64, or whatever k you want to figure out. All right? Any questions about all this stuff at this point? Nope. Okay. So I think starting with the next class, I will give you certain sample questions from midterms from past semesters. Okay. Um, one of those you know, things, okay, let me switch back to uh, this over here. So one of those things would be in the form of a Sudoku. So I will give you a sample of addition. It will have certain known digits, you know, zeros and ones, and then many places will be missing. Your job is to fill in the missing places. It sounds a whole lot easier than it really is. Okay, because I can give you like only one or two known bits, and then from those two one and one or two known bits, and knowing the rules, you know how R of uh, how Q of I is defined, how K of I plus one is defined, and how S of I is defined, you should be able to figure out the rest. So we'll start to do some of those exercises starting with the next class, so that you have some exposure of you know how questions are asked. Typically in my classes. Yes. Um, will, we be, well, will we be doing these like in class or in the lab? So with those your particular Sudoku your problems, I'll give those problems to you, and I will come back and talk about the solution in the following class, so that you guys have plenty of time to review the material, to find out you know how things are defined because you know, from today's lecture. I think it is safe to assume that some people do not remember those definitions, nor do they know where to find them. So I want to give people the opportunity to study the material, know where to find the definitions, and try to understand the definitions first. So that's going to take time. So I will kind of do it kind of slow, you know, give you guys the problem, and you guys have two or you know, four days to uh, figure out the answer. Because the, the whole process of doing this is study. Okay, now if somebody is to ask, oh, you know, so do you have the answer to that question? That is not study. <laughs> but trying to figure out you know, everything by yourself and in the process, looking up all the definitions and figure out you know, how things are connected, that is studying. Studying in this class is not just reading the material and trying to memorize everything. That is not going to be helpful. Knowing where to find the definitions is helpful. Knowing how the definitions are derived can be helpful, but knowing how to apply the, the definitions, that is key. So are we still doing okay so far with this class? Okay. Um, well, that concludes the lecture for today. I will open up the lab for today. So the labs are also important because a lot of concepts that we talk about in class, they are reinforced in the labs. So that means you know when you when you're done with the lab, it sometimes it helps to go back and review the actual labs that you have completed because the concepts that you have learned in the labs is actually useful in the class. So today's lab is multi-bit stuff. And let me go ahead and change a few things. So The due time, the due date is going to be 1.20 p.m. today. The access code is just multi, you know, so I'm, I'm writing out on the whiteboard. All right, save and publish. So now you guys can take a short break first if you want to, and then get started with this multi-bit stuff lab.
Are there any questions? Okay, all right. So remember, you know, my office hour is right after the lab, which is 1.30, you know, so I'll be in my office at 1.30, but I'm usually on campus, you know, you know way before the, the start of this class. So if you need to talk to me about the material or want me to clarify certain things, you know, just come talk to me, you know, in my office. And other than that, I'm all done. So I can stop the recording now.